the problem was was that that it was on a hurry up schedule for and it wasn't about fans it was about shareholders right and the thing is that when gaming started it was never about shareholders until money became the main issue and now money is the main driver and so it's become less and less about product and it's become more and more about money Welcome to another installment of Jam More Interviews. I'm your host, Josh, AKA Jam More, and I have an extremely special guest for you all today. He's the voice of Liu Kang and Fujin in Mortal Kombat 11, Carrie Uridine in Cyberpunk 2077, Persuader in Justice League vs. The Fatal Five, The Host, Rushin, and Liang in Love, Death, and Robots, Luca in Witcher the Nightmare of the Wolf, Tomorat and G.I. Joe Renegades. You can also see and take on the on-camera roles of Marty Mantle in Riverdale, THX in Powers, and he has over 100 acting credits to his name. He's done a lot and is the true definition of a renaissance man. Can you please help me welcome underrated legend, actor, writer, producer, and all around a kick-ass and amazing individual, Matthew Yang King! You're here. Thank God, and we're ready to go. Oh my God! How are you, man? I'm good. How you doing, man? I'm doing fine. Doing just fine. So glad you were able to make it. But before I get into my questions, I'll just like to say how much of an honoring and humbling experience it is to be getting able to speak to you. Such a huge fan of your oh. body of work, been looking over and and researching, and I'm just really glad to be speaking to you today. So again. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come speak with me, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you. You're very kind. I appreciate it. Now we're going to start, you're going to start off the interview, actually, on a segment I like to call <laughs> Off the Dome, where you get to talk about whatever you want and love. That's how I love to start off all my interviews now. You know, you get to talk about anything you want, anything at all. You can talk about the food you just ate, a good nap you just had, the sleep you had, anything at all. The floor is... <laughs> I had an amazing burger. No, um, let's see, what's on my mind right now? Goblins Animated. That's 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 like my whole existence right now is this animated show I'm doing right now with Phil Lamar. So like literally everything that we're doing is getting this animated show going. It's amazing. It's basically a Dungeons and Dragons story told from the monstrous point of view. Um, and, you know, with all of the love that Critical Role is getting and, and everything, Matt Mercer's actually in the show as well. Is we've got almost the full cast of Futurama, uh, Maurice LaMarche, we got Billy West in there, we got Jim Cummings, we got Jen Hale, we got Tara Strong. So we got the best voice actors in the business bringing you a pretty amazing piece. And we're just, uh, we're, we're taking it out to studios right now. Jay Oliva came on. Uh, Jay is an incredible creator um, who did the show Trece that I'm on. Uh, Jay also did... Um, See, what else did Jay do? Jay is basically the director of everything DC you've watched over the last 10 years. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Jay is, Jay is, he also was Zack Snyder's storyboarder and stuff like that. So he, he's created the sort of moments that, that, that Zack, Zack Snyder um, created. So we've got an incredible cast and we're ready to bring this thing out. You know, we feel that we're more relevant now than we ever have been because you know philomar's black man i'm an asian man bringing you um a story from a trans creator because uh ellipsis stevens who created goblins animated is a trans creator and, and her wife uh bringing this story of a bunch of monsters saying why their lives matter and please stop killing us so we um you know and, and it's it's funny it's it's uh it's heartfelt and it's based on the Goblins webcomic, which appears on Google before the definition of a goblin. So if you haven't checked it out, do so, because it's, it's amazing. Fantastic, man. I know you guys have been at this for like a long time now. I remember when Phil Lamar was talking about this on a uh, James Arnold Taylor interview back in like 2017, I think. Yeah, somewhere uh, I, know we, hey, I think we came, no, I came up with the idea in, well, God, what, like 20, 2011 was when I first went to, at that point, uh, Ellie, Ellie was named Terrell Stevens and went, hey, let's turn it into an animated show. And then I courted him before he transitioned for 10 years. 
Um, and now, and then Ellie came on board and was like, you know what, let's do this thing. And so like two, I want to see right before the pandemic was when we was when we went live with it. And then basically pandemic threw everything into a, into a fairly well. And, you know, I'm stuck in my office, like, how are we going to ship this out when nobody's shipping anything? So it was fun. How close are you guys to like getting something out or like a trailer or like an episode? We, we or... have the trailer. We have all of it done. The problem is right now that once uh, something exists on the internet, it exists forever. And what we want is to make sure that the show that we want gets out into space, right? That it's not just the trailer that we were creating two years ago because we've gone through such social upheaval. And what's weird is that the show got there first. The show was dealing with those issues before anybody else. And so we want to, we basically have tailored the script to, to really enhance what we feel are the strengths of the show. We want to make sure that we see that before we put out in um, a trailer that then goes out to every executive and the executive goes, oh, okay, that's what you want it to look like. We're like, no, 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 this, this is the, the picture. And especially now with Jay's involvement and, and the amazing animation that he brings to it, uh, we want to make sure that that's on it. Oh man, I can't wait. That sounds exciting to have all those creators there. Like, like you say, all those vo great voice actors who have just have a fantastic resume who really bring it whenever they're in the studio. That's such a phenomenal yeah. feat to be able to bring all yeah. those creators in the room. Is he Bloom the most workingest uh, video game actor of all time and the voice of Wolverine? So once you hear Steve Bloom go crazy with it, you, you know, it's amazing. I know. I yeah, I've spoken to Steve on here before, and it's just been such, like, hearing him do the voices and how he gets in the character. It's, just, it's such a fantastic process. I mean, for any voice actor, period, it's just so amazing to hear your guys' thought process going into characters or creating this specific voice or what helps you the most create this character at that moment. It's just right. a fantastic process. That's why I love speaking to voice actors in particular because it's such an interesting process to me that I've always been interested in how you guys decode and break things apart and remake it like taking a bad impression that you did and making it a whole new animated character that lives on in tons of people's minds like for generations or you know even years and years and making up childhoods of so many around the world is such a a, a a domino effect that i truly love and appreciate about the business so Thank i really you. love that yeah. that's i mean i mean that's billy west always called it disembodying so we're, we're basically, you're, you're sort of able to step out of yourself and find the voice that that, that picture should have rather, rather than what you'd have. I mean, you know, we're all just chasing Dee Bradley Baker at the end of the day. It's, it's so pretty. It's all, it's so glamorous. Yeah, what God D is like a beast. Another, another like icon. Just so, like I don't know how he does it. I don't know if y'all are even looking at him or like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, talk about I, did, um, I, I got I got lucky enough to do uh, Star Wars Clone Wars, um, and what was sad, what what was amazing was I had done uh, Clone Wars, and we did this big, beautiful eight episode um, arc. Um, and I got to work with D and watch him in the room. And it was funny because that was really my first introduction to D other than knowing his work and like walk in the room and they're like, okay, D, so you're going to do a, a, a dinosaur. And I was like, okay, let's watch this guy do a dinosaur. And, uh, and then he like goes like, he like literally shoves his fingers into his face as far as he can. And suddenly this noise comes out of his face. Like I've never heard, and and the thing about D is not only does he do these incredible voices, but he emotes as them. So he'll do like not just dinosaur, but like sad dinosaur. And you're like, yeah, that's exactly what a sad dinosaur would sound like. And I'm like, how does that guy have that in his brain? But yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to get to be able to you know be in with working with George Lucas, working with Dave Filoni, working with D, and 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 doing that full thing up until the whole thing crashed. But you know, that's a whole other story. Wait, who were you playing in the Clone Wars? Because I I didn't know that. Okay, so I play a character named Nix Okami. You can look him up. N Y X Okami, and 
I came out on a big long cycle with Ahsoka when she was away from Anakin. And I believe that the, the NDA still says that they will kill me if I say anything other than the name which was released um, at Star Wars Fest. And basically it was done, it was shot, it was in the can, it was beautiful. I'm a few credits short. This is going to hurt pretty bad, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, will it hurt me or you? <laughs> And then, um, and then George sold Star Wars, <laughs> and Disney had Star Wars on the clone on on the Cartoon Network, and ain't no way Disney gonna give money to the Cartoon Network. So the whole thing went down until rights reverted to Disney, and then they brought it back up. And by the time they had brought it back up, Me Too had just happened, and so Disney felt that it was more important for Ahsoka to have disciples, to have these three young women who were um, with her rather than having a love interest. So uh, so that's where, where they went. They went with that rather than said, and it was a bummer for me because um, George at the time had said that he had wanted to honor the roots of Star Wars through um, Hidden Fortress and the Japanese roots through Kurosawa and stuff like that. And so he wanted to bring out this Japanese character because um, Okami is like this mystical wolf. And so it was fun to play this like very like Han Solo as a teenager kind of character, um, which was super, super fun. And we had some amazing adventures and I, I couldn't wait to see them. And then I did get to see some of them. Um, and then the whole thing crashed and then they brought it back and then me too. And then, then I, you know, so it was like, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, so that's one of my true regrets, but that has nothing to do with me. I mean, I got to have the fun in the room. It's my true regret that, that, that people don't really get to ex experience Nick's because he was one of the most fun roles I've ever gotten to do. <sighs> so, you know, <laughs> I've, I've spoken to Corey Burton who plays Count Dooku on that show and Cad Bane and Zero and thousands of other characters on that show. And he was just talking about those unfinished episodes that you were in. So, so now I know where you're at. You were in part of the unfinished batch and he was yeah. just so bummed out by that personally because he feels like that was his best work on the Clone Wars. Was those, there were, um, episodes? those episodes are incredible. They're real. And I'm, my nephew is a huge Clone Wars fan. And so I was, you know, more than anything, I was trying to do him on it, right? Like this little kid, I'm like, what? Now, now he's like gigantic. Now he's like towers over me. But uh, when he was little, you know, he was just, he always had Star Wars Legos lying around the house. And so when I got to do that job, I was like, this one's for Jack. This one is for this little kid who gets to do this. Because I wanted to be able to go to his house and like sit with him and go, here's a script. And like, I, I'm not supposed to have this, you know, you know but I, I didn't even get to do that. So, you know, ain't no scripts left with me, nothing left. I was like, all right, sorry, Jack. Something existed, but I can't tell you about it. I hope, I know that, you know, they've, they've finished with the Clone Wars and stuff, but I really do hope at some point maybe they look back at all of that great lore because there's a lot of great stuff there. Like like you said, there's stuff where Anakin was just kind of dealing with Ahsoka leaving and, and coming to grips with that and just that yeah. moral conflict. And it's just like those stories are so important and so crucial to characters and growing them and developing them to, to where we see them. Um, in the films, and it's just, uh, just bums me out because even though I <laughs> love the final season with the Siege of Mandalore and seeing Darth Maul like fighting it out with the Soka duking it out in Order sixty six and stuff, I really would have loved to see in those unfinished arcs like the one on Geonosis or Cad Bane fighting Boba Fett, which for some reason we didn't see in the book of Boba Fett. Who knows why? But that's all. There's a whole other thing. But you know, that's a whole other. I could go. I could go a long diatribe on the book of Boba Fett, but who knows? I mean, at the end of at the end of the day, you have to respect the fact that George and and was a, the most successful independent filmmaker of all time, right? 
And at the end of the day, you got to respect that independent spirit that he's just an artist trying to make, right? He's you or me doing what we do, trying to make our own projects, right? George just did it on a whole nother scale. So you, you just got to, you got to respect game. Game's got to respect game. And then that's, that guy has the best game out there. It's not, you know, it's not close. So like, you know, Spielberg, as much as I love him, he's my favorite film director. He came up through the studio system. George basically went, you know, did one movie in the studio system, declared it stressful, and then went for the rest of the time, now I'm going to do it myself, you know? And so whatever his decisions, whatever their decisions are, you know, I got to respect that because that, you know, even if I, I'm not the fan of this movie over this movie or this over this, I got to respect it because at the end of the day, it's his baby, it's his dream, right? He's an independent filmmaker, right? And, uh, you know, that's why when Disney has it, I'm kind of like, oh, okay. I see what you're trying to do, but it feels like Star Wars by committee more than more than it does feel like it feels like one man's dream. I can't wait for Kenobi. That's all I'm going to say. I can't wait for that. I got the okay. loose. Well, see, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I mean, you know, you know, I, I just want to know. I, I just want to know, like, well, you know, he was following you on some damn fool idealistic crusade. Right. I want, I want to see, like, what what's the damn fool idealistic crusade? It's most icely. You've never seen a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Right? I want some... <laughs> That's such a kick-ass impression. Oh, my God. Right? I want, to see, I want to see, like... Yeah, I've wanted to do Kenobi for years, right? Like, I want to do, like, the full Alec Guinness Kenobi. Let me go in and be old Obi-Wan Kenobi. Let me do... Right? Like, let me be that guy. I don't want to, I don't want to play young Kenobi. Give me, give me the, give me the ten years or five years right before, before that. Like, give, give me those years. So give me that five years, right? Because all I want to know is what the damn fool idealistic crusade is. Oh, I just man. go father's lightsaber. <laughs> oh come on, man! Oh, I can see it. I can see it. Oh, <laughs> but, you know, I've I, I researched you for this interview, and and I've been so excited to talk about a lot of stuff you've gone through, but you know, uh, one thing I love about these interviews is getting to know more about you as a person. So my first question to you would be is, how would you say your childhood influences have helped you as an artist in an ever-changing entertainment landscape? Wow, uh, that is a complex question. How have my childhood influences changed me as an artist in, an, in a changing landscape? Well, that's two different things. Because childhood, childhood, right? Yeah. That's sort of me looking back. And then the landscape now, which is ever changing, is a completely different thing. So, so first, as a child, I was an only child. And so a lot of my life was about sort of being in a book or being nose in the stand, sand with some ants or sort of creating on my own. And I have, um, uh, a mother who is intensely left-brained and a father who's a children's book writer and intensely right-brained. He's a poet and everything like that. So between them, I sort of fall between them. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a theater major with a physics minor, right? So it's like I fall in between the two. And I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by a family that, that basically constantly pushed me towards this stuff. So my dad... Uh, created film strips back in the day. So my dad gave me my first, first voiceover job when I was like five. And he, he made me play Susie. I don't know why I was Susie and my friend Alicia got to play Timmy, but she's Timmy and I'm Susie. I mean, that's not right, but fine. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, doing Blackboard Bear was like my first job. And then, uh, you know, uh, I would watch my dad's you know like this is a molecule Boom, right it would be like the film strip like you turn in it um and then uh my uncle uh and aunts were the editors of bantam books and uh tour books respectively in fact my aunt beth um was the editor for george r, r. martin robert jordan orson scott card you know every major sci-fi writer you know even Neil Gaiman credits my uncle Tappan because uh, he wrote a book called uh, Downtown, and he credits my uncle Tappan as being the reason why he wrote Neverwhere. So, um, 
you know, and my Wait, uncle was the lead so editor. <laughs> yeah. Now, that I have, is I have insane. A, you know, I have, yeah. And my, my uncle was the editor for Twilight Zone magazine. So I was lucky enough that they were the ones passing me books. So them and between that, my my grandmother, who was part of the information department at the New York Public Library, and my grandfather, who owned the bookshop, I was constantly surrounded by people who were just like chucking stuff at me. Um, and then long story short, Poltergeist scared the shit out of me. Um, really bad, really, really bad. <laughs> and in order to cope, with these constant nightmares, my, my grandfather, my kunkle, my Chinese grandfather, took me to, to the Stanford Public Library, and I would sit in the basement, and I would read these little thin orange books on the making of movies, on how face makeup was put on, and how they moved the camera, and all these different things. And that was my first love. That was my first, well, oh, okay, it's not, it's not, his face wasn't really coming off. It's a special effect. Oh. And so I started loving it then. And then I got lucky enough to go to the West End of London and see Anthony Hopkins and Gigi Goy um, play M. Butterfly on stage. And I had like second row seats. And watching that man perform, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing forever. And so at 13, my mom had wanted me to be a concert violinist. My at thirteen, my mom, I, I sort of went, no, that that's it, that's that's the job. I did a I did a roll on stage at thirteen. The bug bit, and that was it. So from thir I, I'm still on plan A. I'm still on I'm still on the plan that I came up with when I was thirteen. So it's weird. So every time like I get those one of those little Facebook posts, it's like, don't you wish you did the dream that you were when you were a child? I'm like, no, I did it. I'm still doing it. It's weird. Um. <laughs> I'm, and it worked, which is weird. It worked. I got to do these things. This is weird. Um, and then uh, how do I do that in a changing media landscape? Um, I'm just lucky, right? I, I, I feel like I'm 10 years, a little bit 10 years too late. Um, because like right now, all these roles for like 30 year old, 20 year old Asian dudes are coming out. And I'm like, oh, Damn it. Wouldn't I? Oh, but I'll play their dad. I'm happy. I'm happy playing Charles Melton's dad on Riverdale. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Charlie Melton is one of the prettiest human beings that you ever get to stand next to. You know, I don't I don't care who you are. You stand next to Charles Melton, you feel ugly. Um, you know, like Charles, George Clooney stand next to Charles Melton and be like, I should have put on makeup this morning. Um, but, I mean... <laughs> You know, like, the guy's, the guy's, like, ridiculously, I mean, that whole cast is ridiculously handsome. You just hang around and just go, all right, just stop. Just stop. <laughs> just, you know, I did a movie with Patty Patch, and, uh, and then we do Riverdale, and, 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 you know, she's amazing. She's amazing. One, she's, she, I mean, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, her, her, her movie where she's playing blind is unreal. And she, she just, she powers that whole film, and it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but, uh, you know, so she's a, she's a stand-up actress, absolutely stand-up actress. Um, and just so easy on the eyes, it's ridiculous. Um, but all of them are. And they're all, they're all like hard, hard-working folks. Um, but the, the, the changing environment right now, I would say it's just, I'm trying to ride it like a surfer. You know, it's, uh, the environment is constantly changing. We're giving voice to the voiceless for the first time. And we're really swinging the pendulum in the other direction. And it's making a lot of people really uncomfortable because it means that they haven't, they don't have their, um, their places of comfort, their places where they feel powerful. And I respect that. I understand that. It's, it's very difficult being in a position where you're out of power. I have a lot of my friends who are who are Caucasian actors who who have worked for years consistently and they're like, I can't get a job. I can't get anybody to see me. I mean, I don't understand, you know, unless I unless I'm Asian, I'm not getting a guest star. And I'm kind of like, huh, I wonder that was my first 
15 years in the business. But what's it like doing one year of that? That's that's hard. That's real it's hard, hard, isn't it? Okay. And, it and, and it was interesting having a conversation a couple of times and going, yeah, that sucks. That's it sucks. It sucks both ways, you know, and it's it's really difficult. Um, but it's amazing. Like I just did the audio book Rise, which is all about Asian Americans um, in the business and watching really, you know, it, it catalogs the last 25 years of Asian American development, probably even further. Actually, maybe uh, I would even say 50 years of Asian American development. Um, but really, every time it touches on entertainment over the last 20 years, I've been able to go, oh, yeah, I was there. I was there. I was there. I did that. Oh, yeah. I remember auditioning for Harold and Kumar. Oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's it's amazing to read it in book form, the things that you've actually experienced. So as to the changing environment, I'm just I'm on my surfboard and I'm hoping to ride it and, and, and hoping to bring light to more people who deserve it. I mean, it, I, I have a I have a cameo account and, and uh, I'm always amazed at people who want to reach out to me to wish them happy birthday or to or to or to um help them with some time when they're feeling low i mean it's immensely flat it's like me you need me to do that for you well you know what would i need if i was really feeling low and and almost always you know i'm, I'm i want to go out of my way to to really try and make them feel better to understand that there's somebody out there that, that that's for them. I mean, the thing is that we, you know, it, it, you know, I've been through some tough times recently and it's like one of the things to realize is that you're, you live on a planet of 7 billion people, which means not only is there somebody who knows what you're going through, there's somebody who's going through exactly what you're going through. Exactly down to the iota, right? Right now. And maybe some of them have more resources and some of them have less, right? There's some, there's some things, you know, people dealing with a disease, people dealing with depression, people with dealing with all, all these things that we're dealing with. And yet they're doing it in Ukraine right now, right? There are people dealing with all these different things. And so, you know, anytime you're, you know, my, my thing is always, if we can ray, give voice to the voiceless, then I'm, then I'm doing the right job. Probably should have just said that and just cut the rest of it short. <laughs> no, I, I love the stories, man. No, I, I, I love that sentiment and I love that idea. And that's the power of entertainment and the arts. And I just love that so much. That's what's so appealing to me as a young artist in this industry trying to make his way in is just what you said right there, just making stories about people who aren't, aren't really heard of in the media or are now getting pushed more into the forefront because of the ever-changing you know, social landscape, finally getting good representation stuff like shang chi or or you know black panel is like stuff like that, i love you know? shang i love shang chi but i still have problems with it i love shang chi but i, I still i still have problems with it because his superpower is martial arts and that's something we actually do that is that is like that's like a 1968 comic with people going hmm what do asians do well we can't have them fire fire from their hands that would be weird Let's give them as their superpower martial arts. No, asshole. That's something we do. Like, like, like we do that. Like, that's like, what are you, what are you gonna do? Like, are you gonna give an? Uh, let's say we have an Irish superhero. Let's give him. Uh, let's give him freckles. Like, come on. <laughs> like, let's, like, what? Right. No. Yeah. yeah. I I let's give him this making. This guy's power is Guinness making. No. <laughs> I know he's fun at the parties, though. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Here's Guinness man. Like, Oh, thank you, Guinness man. That's amazing. <laughs> and we're That's, delicious. Guinness. That's delicious. Guinness man and the legend of the five rings on the table. Oh, who put <laughs> rings on my table? Stupid, stupid. Oh, yeah, but no, yeah, definitely. Like, but you know, but you know what I'm saying. Like, this, just stuff like that, getting a, a lead like that. You know, it was something that some people, you know, couldn't even imagine. You know, back in back way way back in the day, you know, headlining a major blockbuster like that is a huge achievement. Absolutely. And, and handled and, it. And he did it, 
and he looked great on screen. And and Aquafina was outstanding. I wish I was half as funny as that woman, you know, on any day. And yeah, and it's just so awesome to see stuff like that. And that's why I love the arts. And I'll always be me and you have the same sentiment, like giving a voice to the voiceless and just making stories be making good stories and making stories that inspire people and empower people and make them feel okay in whatever situation they're going through. Because like you said, when we go through dark times, you know, there's someone, there's somebody else, you best believe there's someone else who has been just in that same position that you are in or feels what you're feeling. And just knowing someone relates and understands and hears you is just such a amazing thing to know that you're not alone in your struggles. And that's why I just, I Every love, time we I make stories to a specific set of people, we end up making stories that are universal. You know, it's, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, we can't at the same breath say, why do we keep on telling the same 10 stories in Hollywood over and over and over and over and over again? And then in the same breath in, in the buying rooms go, well, I don't really know if there's a market for it. I don't really understand. You know? Like, pick a side, right? Either we need to put out new stories that have new voices that tell new things, or we need to pitch to the middle, right? And then everything's vanilla ice cream. And you know what? Vanilla's ice cream's nice. It's really great, but everybody dresses it up, you know? So, like, let's get some new flavors in there. Let's, you know, I want some pear Riesling ice cream, please. I want some pear Riesling with some with some candied walnuts. That's what I want. <laughs> Definitely relate to that, man. There's there's so much uh, to, to do and look forward to, like that Goblin show I'm so excited to do. You've also done a ton of stuff like uh, the World of Steampunk I was looking into, something you started uh, in 2009, I believe I was. Oh, dude, it. dude, that is a long and sordid tale, yeah. I'm actually finally, this year, fingers crossed, getting the short out. You know, that was, that's me overreaching is what that is. That's a, that's a beautiful story, but that's me overreaching because I raised a bunch of money. I raised $125,000 on Kickstarter. It was the highest funded pilot ever on Kickstarter, um, which is great. And you look at it and you go, that's a lot of money. Uh, and then, you know, Henson picked it up and uh, Mike Metavoy picked it up and a bunch of people, you know, walked me around town and said, here's what we're going to do. And then a bunch of people told me not to shoot. So don't shoot. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't shoot. And I said, okay, because you know a lot more than me. You, you produce really big movies. You created the movies of my youth. Okay, I won't shoot. And then, you know, a year passed and they were like, hey, everybody passed that we talked to. We're going to pass two things. And so I ended up with like a, a tax bill that was like on $125,000. And like, oh God, how are we going to do that? And so I had to do all this like hoop jumping to get my stuff made in a very short period of time, finally got it out. And then, you know, the problem was I had to, because of the, the time frame, I have 485 CG shots and 400 and suddenly $125,000 budget with 485 CG shots don't look like a lot of money. So, you know, if I had shot like a romantic comedy, it'd be done in great right now. But I decided to shoot Victorian science fiction. Which means out of those 485 shots and an hour long movie, I got 12 minutes that I can show. I got 12 minutes. I got a hot, I got a hot 12 minutes. So, you know, and, and that's about to be done. That's about to be done. I, I, I started working with this amazing, amazing composer. He's wonderful. His name is Ivan Titkoff. Incredible dude. Um, and he's in Russia. <laughs> And so now it's like, how am I going to pay this guy? I don't think I'm paying this guy. I think he's embargoed. I don't think that's going to happen. So how's this going to happen? All right. So that's my, that's my current cross the bear. My gosh. But yeah, man, it's, it's just so amazing what you've done. You've done so much stuff. Like I said in the beginning, you're a writer, a director, a producer. You worked on Wall Street. You practiced Zen. You've done so much stuff prior to acting, violin, playing piano, doing so much stuff like that. And I'm sure with all of those experiences, you gained a whole lot of perspective and a whole lot of knowledge on tons of different topics. How would you say gaining that perspective and that knowledge 
has helped you grow as an artist throughout the years? Oh, goodness. I don't know whether my, my perspectives allowed me to grow as an artist. I think maybe in, in certain ways it's distracted from it. It's, um, it's sort of filled in the edges in, in a way. Sometimes I feel as an artist that it's better to focus on just one thing because I am such a jack of all trades. Sometimes I feel like I've, I've distracted from what I have. I feel like it's offered me more life wisdom than anything else. Um, as an artist, however, sometimes I feel like, you know, it, it, at least in a, in a capitalistic society, if you want to make money at it. It's like better to make a widget, you know, here, this is just my one NFT of my one image, of my one thing like that. Right. That seems to be, but as, as you know, as a jack of all trades, as sort of the bard able to do all the things, I suppose w what, what my art has really done is made me a good father. <laughs> And and sort of able able to teach my kids, uh, able to teach my kids across across many different different disciplines, and been able to see them, um, you know, because I've done all these things, I'm able to look at them. Oh, you're good at martial arts. Okay, here, let me. I'll teach you the beginning, and then we'll throw you to somebody. All right, look at my daughter and go. Okay, you're good at piano. Okay, here's how to play piano. All right, good. Now we'll give you a teacher. And I get a little. Oh, okay, you're good at writing. Okay, okay, let's do writing. Are right, you want filmmaking? Okay, here's filmmaking, right? So I can, you know, it's like I can teach beginner level to everybody. <laughs> How do you manage time, man? Like you have three I don't kids, speak. you have actors. <laughs> <laughs> because that's like something like that's so much i mean you're doing voice acting and you're also an art and camera artist and then you're working on goblins anime and then i'm sure there's other things in the works that you're working on right now that you can't yeah. even talk about so like i can't even imagine being in your own shoes like dealing with three kids like that's like sounds like so much to like oh do. yeah i'm ben frank in 2022 if you have three kids people are like you're ben franklin like you know you got like 19 kids and like you know, three of them died in childbirth. That's like, you know, you have three kids. You're like, how? How? But I don't remember like growing up, you're like, you have a brother and a sister? <gasps> That's amazing. Like, I don't, but now like I'm Ben Franklin. I'm like, uh, like I, people are like, wow, dude, put it down. Like, stop, leave her alone. Right? Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know why I do, you know? Um, no, but then I, I feel like three kids is easy, you know, because like one kid, one kid's like, how do I keep this thing alive? Right. Like you're like, I'm going to F this up. I know. And then two kids, it's like texting while driving. You're just like you're you're going to you're going to crash or you're going to text somebody the wrong word. Right. Something's going to go bad. Right. You don't because you're you're always doing this. Right. It's just not good. And then three kids is just like, well, they got to learn how to juggle knives at some point. I mean, they got to, you know, they just got to figure it out. This has got to happen. And that's, so three kids is pretty much, they solve it. And then the rest of it is just literally, uh, I, I have a, have a, um, an adage with myself, which is basically if it, if it makes money, if it makes money, then it's got to get half an hour of work a day, period. If it doesn't make money and I want it to make money, then it's got to get an hour's worth of work a day, period. And that's it. And that's basically the, that's basically the game, you know? So, and, and you know, I, I can go, oh, okay, I was on Riverdale and we did eight hours of shooting today. That covered my acting for a little bit, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm good, right? We're, I'm, I'm good. I don't have to cover that stuff. Like, so the stuff I need to concentrate on is the stuff that I do in the, in the dressing room, right? That's my practice. You know, I was lucky because I started violin at five that I know how to practice and I know how to practice really, really well. You know, so, you know, my, my cousin is um, is an incredible uh, concert violinist named Simone Porter. Um, she's one of the best in the world. She's uh, she's outstanding. And I remember being with her at our cousin's wedding and floating out in the blue in Aruba and go, what's it like being you? Like, how do you, I've watched you like crush it. Right. Because this is a kid who like soloed with the Seattle Symphony at, at like nine years old. Right. She played with the New York Phil at like at, at 10. She's unbelievable. She's unbelievably good. 
And I was like, what's it like being you? She goes, I don't have any ref reference point other than myself. And I was like, okay. But I've watched you like win every single time. Like you do, like you go and you win and you do it and you win and you do it and you win. How? She goes, again, I don't have any reference point other than myself, but I do know that an hour's worth of practice now is worth two when I'm 20 or three when I'm 30. And now it's coming from a kid who was like 13. So I, mean, I just try to be like my cousin. <laughs> I just try to copy her. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's what I try to do is try to make schedules for myself, you know, schedule off time to, to get things done. Cause I, I go to college and then I do these and then I edit and then I have a ton of other stuff that I, that I do. So, so it's tough, but you know, I try my best to like schedule things out and, trying to put my phone aside because my phone distracts the hell out of me like yeah if my phone is around me I'll, i'm probably not getting anything done so i put it aside or put it in a different room and, and then just get to cracking so that just remember if you're ever on the phone or anything else just ask anything you're doing if you have a moment of like i shouldn't be on the phone right now right you'll go back because our body likes chocolate cake like we like chocolate cake so if you're ever on that in, in a moment where you think you're about to do a bad habit or you're in a bad habit, right? Real easy thing. Just ask yourself, is this what I want to get good at? Do I want to be at the end of life and like, this is what I'm good at. I'm good at this. Right? Is this what I really want to get, what I want to get good at? Right? My wife, I, I remember I was, I, cause I got addicted. I got addicted to World of Warcraft. When I, I, I would like play that thing. And I'm one of the main voices in it. So I was like, you know, oh, it's me. Like, I, I got to play, you know, I'm Illidan. I got to be, right? So, right? And I remember my wife like, get off. And I was like, I don't have any other habits, woman. Like, I'm not, I would never say woman because she would just punch me in the face. But I would, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> You know, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not a heavy drinker. I don't do drugs. I'm not out all night. Like this is where I deprogram. This is where I de-stress. Like, give me a break. And she goes, look, I just don't want you spending all that time in somebody else's imagination rather than your own. That's deep right there. That's deep, you know? So spend the time in your own imagination. Make stuff for everybody else. That's, that's, that's my adage. Beautiful message, beautiful message. And you've you definitely done wonders with those adages. Just you have a fantastic career. You've done so much stuff that I didn't even know about and I was looking into like you're the voice of the Call of Duty trailers. Like I didn't even yeah. know that. The Call of Duty what, what do you do like for the trailers? Because I was looking at stuff and I couldn't hear you. Like what do you do for the oh, trailers? Oh, that's just dropping that's dropping down into Glow because I had done Broadway. I sang I sang on Titanic the musical. And they had me sing second tenor for so many years that I damaged my chords. So now I have this buzz that actually, if I relax completely, there's a buzz on my chord, which actually is also uh, Carrie from uh, from Cyberpunk, right? Like yeah. Carrie, Cyberpunk is someone who's resting down here, right? So it's in the bottom part of my range, resting on the part that's damaged, right? It's just sitting right here, right? And then Carrie's from, to me, Carries from Queens, right? So there's a little bit of Queens sitting in, there, right? So, you know, Carries from Greenpoint, Brooklyn, right? And he and he knows that this is where it's from. And then, if you want to do that, then you just slide it into neutral, right? Right? You said so. You're not putting it in a place. Slide it into neutral, right? And then drop it down half an octave. Then you put a little Taco Bell on it, right? Taco Bell. Everything's always cool at Taco Bell, right? Everything's awesome, right? So then you drop that down and you're a lie. It's just a lie, right? Everything's cool when you're doing Call of Duty. Everything's amazing, right? That's all it is. It's, it's damage. It's damage, low voice, and Taco Bell. That's, that's Call of Duty right there. What the? What? That is so good. That's so cool. Wow. So you, you still do that job currently? Um, I can't say. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I am all of duty adjacent, perhaps. Okay. No, I can't say.
one Again, of the first I'm roles doing trailers earlier. Well, one of the first roles I was introduced to your incredible vocal range on was G.I. Joe Renegades. Oh, yeah. I love Tunnel Rat. Oh, where you been crawling, Tunnel Rat? Who's Tunnel Rat? Apparently you are. Such a cool character. Were you a fan of G.I. Joe before taking oh, that yeah. role? Because I know oh, you grew yeah. up. Yeah, because I knew you grew up watching like anime as a kid, you know, watching Robotech. You'd watch that oh, yeah. as a kid and stuff. Wow. Hold on, yeah, no, but but like, yeah, G.I. Joe is like, G.I. Joe was my jam, you know? And I got to hang out with those guys, like, eventually, like, in one of the SAG things. And it was like walking into to Mike Bell's house, right? He was a voice of Duke, right? And like, you know, and having, you know, Michael Michael Bell, like, he, he like, welcome to my house. I call it Casa de Residuales, right? And, uh... <laughs> He's he's incredible. I mean, you want to talk about somebody who's like the voice of the Snorks and Smurfs and GI Joe and was Michael Bell, right? Right. And I love my I love me some Michael Bell. So like, just one, I got to work with KMR with Ke Kevin Michael Richardson. I got to work with 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 the amazing Natalia. I, well, I got it right here. Right. I got you know, I have an action figure. Um. Right. Oh yeah, so, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to work with the amazing Jason Marsden, who is one of the most talented guys in the industry. And, um, you know, I mean, I defy you to have not have fun on a day when you get to work with Kevin Michael Richardson because he's so funny. Um, he's just ridiculously, ridiculously funny. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it was just it, it was just really fun because it was one of the first jobs where I really got to improv and play a character who I felt, you know, like, let's let's not. Because they were like, how do you get, because he was also from Brooklyn, right? Like, how do you get, how do you get an Asian character from Brooklyn? And they saw all these guys. And then I walked in and I was like, nah, he's like Joe Pesci, right? Like, he's a little, right? So he's this little guy. He's got like Joe Pesci, right? Like, he's got to be, he's got to be like, what am I, clown to you? What am I, funny? Right? Um, <laughs> right? So I was like, he's Joe Pesci, right? So I wanted to do, right? And Joe Pesci is just a little bit more whiny. But here, this guy's a hero. So it was like, Joe Pesci's like way up here. Like, what's wrong with you? Why would you, right? A little more Goomba in the front of it. Like, whatever. So I like brought it back. And I was like, so wait, he's, he's this guy back here, right? Like he's, he's straight in. And then um, like they would let me improv and everything like that. And th there's this one Christmas episode where they had asked, you know, like, like, what did you, did you spend a lot of Christmases? And I was like, well, we owned a restaurant called Shalom Hunan. So what do you think? Right. And I loved the, you know, I wanted to make him Asian and Brooklynese and Jewish. Right. Because that was something that I wasn't seeing. So I was like this, we run, humans run the gamut and the more absurd we are, the better. So why not? Why not? Why not do that? Why not make a really absurd, wonderfully, really human character and that's who he was i loved i wish we had gotten another year i felt like everybody was talking about us getting emmys when we when we did that show and it was so beautiful watching kmr work watching jason work watching natalia work and then the hub crashed and it was like oh okay wah, wah. that trombone wah, 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 wah. yeah i that show was so good and i really loved jazz drum renegades because of how it, it paid tribute to the originals while also doing its own thing, right? Yeah. And I just, it's like the A team. It's like then, yeah, then. And, and just keep it true to that. Yeah. And so, yeah. I, I love that show so much. And all of you guys did a phenomenal job as your respective characters. Jason as Duke was a phenomenal choice. And then talking to Michael Bell about working on GI Joe, how he had a great time doing it. Like I yeah, really yeah. do wish you guys would have continued to that show. If the show would have continued, is there something you would have liked to have seen done in that universe or in particular with your character? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted Tunnel Rat to go full full distance, right? Like, I really wanted... I wanted to see, like, like a real episode where, where he got to, to just, like, let it all let it all hang out and be a badass. Because he was still in training, right? So none of them got to the point where they were, like, true, true badass. And I really wanted to see, like, other than the Snake Eyes. The Snake Eyes always shows up, and it's like, okay, you're quiet, and you have a mask on, so you're Boba Fett, you're a bad, I get it. Right, you're done. Right. 
That's my favorite J.I. Joe will always be Snake Eyes. I don't care. It's always going to be Snake Eyes. It's always. easy to ask you knife and he carries it. I mean, this, come on. The Mandalorian. He wears a mask. He carries a sword. And he's quiet. Right? Snake Eyes. He wears a mask. He carries a sword. He's quiet. Right? Boba Fett. He wears a mask. He's scared. Like, I think <laughs> as a human race, we have a thing for people in masks who are quiet. It's like, all right, fine. Disappointed that the movie didn't keep that going, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, exactly. What was your favorite story element about G.I. Joe Renegades and what it did? Oh, I think it was the one where we were finding um, sort of soldiers who had PTSD on the streets and and bringing them up. And then they're, they're, they were having in like an underground fight club with them. And uh, and they were having like this whole thing. And, and my character went in and we had to disguise ourselves and, and pretend to be these roughed up guys. And then we sort of we found out what was going on with the fight club and this injectable. And it was all Cobra. Um, it's really good, you know. It was it was awesome. I mean, come on, that was like Clancy Brown as as Destro, and you know Charlie Adler as as oh, you know Clancy, it's Clancy Brown as Destro just on, by by himself. But then like you know, Charlie Adler is Adler is Cobra Commander. Charlie Adler also the most foul mouth man you will ever meet in your life. I've heard. Um, <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tomo Rat is a pretty established character in the G.I. Joe universe and is pretty, pretty, uh, really interesting. You know, this is not the first time we've played a pretty established character. Of course, Luke Kang. Of course, you play Purse Perkins. So, of course, it was voiced by the phenomenal D. Bradley Baker. When it yep. comes to voicing pretty established characters, how do you go about that? Do you resource the voice? Do you try and do your own thing? Or do you try to put yeah. trip to the original? Perched. Perch, Perch, I researched. Um, uh, I played Mortal Kombat, so I felt like they had never done homage to because, like, the first three guys who who played uh, Liu Kang were white, you know. And it's not it, no offense. I mean, they did a great job, but it was like they're not. They weren't hearing the same vocal tones that I was hearing growing up. So, yeah. You know, somebody being able to hear a Mandarin Chinese accent from a guy who's from mainland China. And then, you know, the fact that, that Liu Kang goes, <laughs> when he does this stuff, he's honoring Bruce, obviously. So I went in and I went, okay, let's do a mainland China version of Bruce Lee, right? So Bruce is a combo, right? Because we always forget, like, Chinese, like, is you are talking and it goes up and down, right? So if it's if it's Cantonese, like Cantonese sounds like you are chopping vegetables, right? Right. Whereas, right, Mandarin Chinese, Mandarin Chinese is very sing song. It goes up and down, right? But then the British came in, and so the like British, and and it's Eton British, so it's a bunch of people from Eton trying to teach. Chinese, how to speak in English, right? You must speak it correctly, right? So you have that and you combine it with the Chinese accent and suddenly you have Hong Kong, right? Hong Kong is right in between, right? And so if you have Bruce Lee, right? All you have to do is add a sneer, right? Like Bruce Lee sneers all the time, right? And you remember that Bruce Lee is from 1968 and he was friends with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and with uh, and, and with uh, Steve McQueen, so everything that Bruce does is actually about being a 1968 cool dude, right? So you have to understand. You have to be like the nature of water. You have to put water into a cup; it becomes a cup. You put water into a bottle; it becomes a bottle. Be like the nature of water, right? So that's what Bruce is. Bruce, like people forget, Bruce, people think Bruce is an Asian accent. It's not. Bruce is a 1968 accent. Right, Bruce is like he is nineteen sixty eight and very cool for school, Jack. Like he always puts Jack on the end of everything. Like, what do you mean, Jack? Right, like. But so then you take that and you add that to Mortal Kombat, and Liu Kang is much more. He's bigger. He's stronger. He's heavier. And so it, you're taking Bruce Lee and you're bringing it down into here, right? So he's much <laughs> larger fellow, and then he is much more formal. Right, so the way that he speaks, so I took all contractions out. So, Bru, uh, so Liu Kang stopped being Kant 
or won't, and he's like, cannot and will not, right? And so everything that he does is very, very straight up. Um, and so that became Liu Kang, and then Liu Kang, Fire Lord Liu Kang is basically, he has a fire burning, so everything is down in here. I am. And I am not. What happened to Raiden? He is part of me, bound to my soul. So then we have the same continuum, but I am also channeling the power of fire. And then you have the Revenant version, who's like this evil version of Liu Kang. Evil! And, and that's just choking on it. Everything is evil. I would have defeated Shao Kahn, but Raiden wanted the glory. His lightning cut me down. I am evil and dark and evil. Yeah. But. Definitely you get more into that. But another 80s franchise you were part of was Transformers, the 2004 video game as Unicron. Destiny. You cannot destroy my destiny. Yeah. Um, do you, what do you remember the most about doing Unicron? It's crazy how that's like, that's the ultimate Transformers villain, but we barely oh, yeah, see yeah. Unicron. Unicron is amazing. Yeah. But that, I mean, actually my favorite one was doing, um, oh, now it's gone. He's a gorilla. He transforms. He uh, robots in disguise, right? Robots in disguise, yeah. He was actually much more fun than you. Unicron's just big and deep, right? Just, I was just trying to do my best Orson Welles. Now, you shall witness its dismemberment. Because right. Orson Welles doing it in the original was the best, and then all the rest of us are just chasing. But, you know, the other one was me doing Niles Crane, right? So it was all just Frasier. Frasier? I don't suppose... Now you are a Transformer, and I think everything is going to be just wonderful. Right, you stupid Autobot. Right. So it's just fun. Unicron is Unicron, but he's fun. What was his name? I can't remember. It starts with the S. He's it a gorilla. Starts with the S. He's on. Yeah. Oh, oh, Simicor. Thank you. Surrendering? No. But thank you for moving closer. I'm here to help. Good. <laughs> but yeah, Good help. Um, if they ever do bring. If they ever do bring back Unicron and they do bring you back, I'd love to see you do it. More because I feel like with your Unicron in particular, you got really that that fancy side. Because with Orson Welles, he had like this dark Shakespearean type thing about I, him. I, I like his more. His is better. He wins. I mean, obviously, I don't want to say that, but like Orson is, is like can't be beat. But if you ever and, do get to do him, well, I, Orson he, Welles could read the phone book. He started off in in radio. He had that Orson Welles tone. Everything was... I mean, come on. It's best. Orson Welles, man. And now we're going to get into the Mortal Kombat talk. But before we get into the Nether Realm type of deal, we have to talk about the role that helped you get Liu Kang, the Atom in Injustice Oh, that's looks fun. Such Let a cool character. We do it at three and... Much with the Atom. It sucks. Uh, and I want him to come back. I mean, he, and actually, I ended up playing that game and, like, beating it. I was like, should I do a Twitch channel? I was like, I should just do a Twitch channel where Please? I just play characters in these things and just, like, go play people and just play in character. I should just go play Call of Duty or, like, go play something. Go, you know, go play Deep Rock Galactic and be like, hi, guys, it's me. I'm the voice actor in the play. That'd be so I, cool. I'd watch that with the heck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody's doing that. You know, Matt Mercer's doing t critical role, but you know. Oh yeah, no, V, I should totally do Cyberpunk. Although I'm too good at it. Like, I don't know, I don't I don't feel much challenge from Cyberpunk. I figured out this like complete nerfy thing and now now I can beat everybody at Cyberpunk and it's no fun. <laughs> I got, I like, the way around put them all to sleep and done. You know, it's like, okay. What did you enjoy about bringing the character of Adam to the forefront in that game? Oh, no, that was just super fun. I just, I love those games anyway. And so, you know, being Ryan Choi and and, uh, and being able to do a Korean dude and, and a Korean scientist, right? You know, Korean the Korean accent always sounds like you are slightly out of breath. So I just want to make sure you, are, hang on. 
<laughs> you understand that, right? Because as a Korean accent, right? Korean accent sounds like you're uh, like like you ran too far. So doing Ryan Choi as uh, the Korean, you know, the Korean at home, and like being able to be the hero and everything like that was so much fun. I love it. What's your favorite uh, move? I have my favorite, but I love. Oh, I love the one where I go and I become a giant and then I smash him down. <laughs> Amazing. Yes! Or the, ear, the ear's pretty good, where I go into the ear and you're like, like ah. Although that's just gross. I mean... Right. Just, just be a dirty mess after that, right? But you know... <laughs> you're like, ah, uh, everywhere, uh. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, man, I hope they bring you back as Adam. I would love if they do make an Injustice 3. Because I know it's coming. I'd really love for you to come back as this awesome character. Give Ant-Man a run for his money. <laughs> I, I'd love it. I love it. Then now we can talk about Mortal Kombat. And I have to be honest with you about Mortal Kombat. It's going to sound a bit harsh, but the first time I heard you as Liu Kang, I absolutely hated it. I, oh. was, I, I did not like it at all. Yo, because I was so it? used... <laughs> no, but listen, listen, listen. Because I was so used to Tom Choi doing it, and I loved his Liu Kang. Tom's great. Different. Tom's really great. He was so pissed at me. I'm so sorry, Tom. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Tom. But not after and it was so listening. Funny. So funny because, like, right after that, I lost out on this really. So they, I think they changed over the voice on some character to to someone else. Like, I think I, oh, it was like the Joker. Like, I got the Joker on 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 something, and and then they went, Nah, we're gonna go a different way. And I was pissed because I was, you know, I I they were like, it was like, oh, I had gotten to do the Joker, right? And I had gotten to do the Joker in my way because I really wanted him to be scary, right? And. You know, because I wanted to try to do him as a psychotic. And then they went the other way. But they did all my reads. So I was like, really? Like, they listened to everything I did. They had the actor act the way I was acting, but they just changed the voice. And I was like, how is that? So I was ticked off about it. And I was like, God, I hate it when they replace you. And nah, so, nah. And Tom Troy wrote me like, yeah, Matt, that sucks. That's real hard, man. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Sorry. Ooh, Oh, sorry, Tom. Because he's really good. I mean, he's really good. He's a legitimate. He's a legitimate force to be reckoned with. He's really good. Absolutely. Really solid. Oh, but that no, good. after listening back to the voice clips and listening to you speak about how you created the voice, I honestly have fallen in love with your version of this character. I really oh, have enjoyed this version of what you did with him. How did you become aware of MK11? Did they make you audition or did they ask you to do something? In oh, that was the threat. That was Direct offer because of because of Adam. They literally saw me at Adam and they went, "Oh, we got to bring he's Liu Kang." Now. They they direct uh, they directly offered me. That is so cool. I know that's that must have been an exhilarating feeling because I know how oh, weird it is. Yeah, and the and they're amazing over there, and they know their their canon backwards and forwards, and you know I've what it's been like three four years now that I've been going into that room like every few months. Like, hey, come in for a few days and we'll record all this stuff. And then you come back and they go, oh, we animated it and check this out. Oh, and now you're Fujin. Go do this. Right. Um, and so it was really, it was really fun. It was, it's, it's been, it's been a really, really fun, especially since I was a teenage gamer and used to play Mortal Kombat all the time. So I was like, and the funny thing was I hadn't really played it. You know, I sort of stepped in now and again up until 11. And I was like, Oh, it got way more violent. I was like, wow, I thought ripping somebody's head off was bad. Like, that's like, oh, psh. <laughs> so what is going on? <laughs> Luke okay. came beating people with fire nunchucks and ripping their head off and tearing their Dude. heart and stuff. <laughs> like, Devorah just needs to go. I was just like, wow, this character is awful. Yeah. Please. Please. <laughs> what helps you the most when creating the voice for a character? Because hearing your process by creating Liu Kang was really interesting. But what do you do for other characters to help create the voice that you make for them? Oh, God. I don't know. It depends on the individual character. Um, either I'll get a sense. Um, I'll, I'll get an immediate, like, oh, this is what it should be, which is my favorite thing. Or... Um, a lot of the times what I try to do is I go to the International Dialects of English Archive, IDEA, uh, and I'll look for people 
who are within a region or who are close to it. And then I really just listen to them over and 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 over again. And then I look at what I watch. Like if I have a picture, I'll listen to them with the picture because I try to figure out like what what would fit that voice. I mean, you know, unless you're Billy West, who like is obsessive. I mean, Billy, I remember he was like, we're doing Goblins, where we're doing the record for Goblins. He was like, hey, Matt, um, hey, check it out. This is how, you ever imagine how a basketball game would sound like to a blind person? And I'm like, no, I would never imagine that at all. All right, so it's like this. And he starts doing the ball and then doing the shoes and then doing the sign. And, then, and I was like, who are you? Like, that's exactly what it would sound like to a blind person. You have way too much time on your hands. Um, like, <laughs> unreal. Yeah, Billy's unreal. Un like, whole nother ball of wax. Like, the stuff he can do is uncanny. Uncanny. I hear a lot of good stuff about Billy in, in that regard to doing that stuff. Voice act is just so cool, man. I just, I love what you guys do and how you know your character. I just, I just love it. I just, fall, I've fallen in love with this side of the business, and that's how nice you guys are. I know a ton of people are talking about how nice voice actors are, and it's really true. You guys are like really kind and really generous, and, and I love that because a lot of the times we have ideas of celebrities about on camera, and they're like, "Oh, he's a jerk. He's gonna be awful. It's gonna spill on you. Be mean." And da 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 this, that, and the third. We we'll always come up with these theories and stuff. It's because you're not being told you're pretty all the time. You're being told you're talented. And so, so if you're if you're getting rewarded for your talent, then you practice the things that make you talented. If you're getting rewarded for being pretty, then you practice being pretty. You practice looking like a thing, right? I don't want to look like an actor, right? I want to I want to be an actor. And so, like, it, it's interesting. I feel all, all the time when I'm looking at voice actors i feel like they're theater actors i feel like you know they're so used to doing big beautiful like roles they're doing these really incredible in-depth kind of discoveries of things and they're not they're not doing you know i mean as much as i love their work i mean there are a few times when i've been in the room with actors who i hold in the highest regard in terms of their work on screen and I've watched them and I've gone, motherfucker, can you read? Right? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, what is... But they've got to do something different. They've got to put the shoes on and put the clothes on and, and do the work to get that far. And it's a different set of skills. It's a really, it's a really, really different set of skills. Um... And uh, being able to bounce between them is really, is hard. Because sometimes, you know, it's like I'll go to Riverdale after working on a lot of voiceover stuff and people will be like, take it down, take it down, take it down. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Damn. That must be a compliment though, like to, to get told to turn that, all, that, all that awesome talent down for these people. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, you want, you want just like, as any actor, you always want just, oh my God, oh, you are so amazing. Right. Although I think we do a lot better if, because every you know actor leaves a set, like people clap. I think this would be so much better if we just, you know, if we clap for everybody. Like, why don't we? Why don't we clap for uh, clap for the sound guy? Like he's working a much harder job. Like, clap for the grips. Sound guy, the editor is the. Oh yeah. Is everything okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just I'm low on power. My phone's like, you're low on power. Oh, uh, okay. So I'll try to wrap this up fast before. Uh, That's all right. I can... I'll just plug. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um. So at his heart, since you have played Liu Kang and gotten a sense of who this person is, at his heart, who is Liu Kang? Liu's all, uh, well, he's, Liu's easy for me because he's basically, same things that I try to do on a daily basis. There's a Japanese belief, and even though Lou is Chinese, they sort of have a similar basis. There's a Japanese belief called giri, G-I-R-I, which is honor, obligation, and duty. 
right? And that's the core. It's a samurai thing, right? It was honor, obligation, and duty. Like I will honor the people who I'm with, right? I've been honored to my society, to my earth, to the people I'm around, right? Obligation is my obligation to care, take care of those who are less than me. Is my obligation to try to aspire to be more, and it's my duty to serve something larger than myself. And that's that's all Lou is. He's just giddy, right? Just honor, obligation, and duty. Always, always, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got some nice art on your background. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's the witness. That's Love Dead and Robots. That's that's, uh, that's from Good Hunting. That's that's from my that's my microphone. That's from uh, Mantle Motors. That's that that's from my um, from my car dealership in Riverdale. So wow, that's all the good. It's fun. Uh, oh, there's all the fun. You got to play both. Yeah. Liu Kang, and of course, Liu Kang has a, a, always with him by his side is Kung Lao. And you got to play Kung Lao in the movie. Oh, excuse me, my allergies well, are killing me. That's my buddy. Uh, that's my buddy uh, Sunil Malhotra, who's doing him in the in the show. Yeah, we're like good. we're like really good friends in real life. So I mean, that's, that's that's always funny. That is so cool. When you got right. to play Liu Kang in, I mean, not Liu Kang, Kung Lao in the movie. What aspirations of Liu Kang do you see in Kung Lao since they're so close with one another? Uh, I don't know. They weren't really related. The, the movie was so different. Um, the, the thing was that, that the way I was doing Kung Lao was a lot closer to Kung was a lot closer to Liu Kang in terms of heroic like nobility than the way Sunil plays him in the video game. The video game is a lot more about snark and about that a lot about being sort of second second fiddle and like wanting to come up and and he's competitive and the the kung lao of the movie was really again he was much more heroic he was much more of a of a noble hero and i and i uh i appreciated that but i i think uh, again i prefer to neil's way love that kung. i would say i hope you come back but of course that character did not make it in the movie so rest in peace kung lao in the film I mean, born in half. That'll that'll have a problem. <laughs> by, by, by Shao Kahn. For Fujin, you got to play the god of... of what's he the god? Fujin. I can't remember. Well, I'm multiple gods. What are you talking about? I'm all the gods. I am god everywhere. I am Liu Kang god and Fujin god. and yeah. What did you love about doing Fujin? Because I love that voice you did for that character. I just love the character. I used to play the character, so I just I just enjoyed doing character, and so I just wanted to make him sound like wind. And so a lot of what he does is moving through the way of wind, right? It's just feeling like he was made out of wind. You may run like the wind, Cabal, but I command it should have devised a better plan so you know plus it's a little bit of honoring um showdown in little to uh, showdown in uh what is it not showdown in little tokyo that's the brandon lee film um kurt russell film uh uh somebody yell it out shown in to uh, anyway it's like him and, oh. and james hall back in the day now i gotta look it up hang on james hall kurt Russell, and it'll come up. Uh, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. There we are. Um, so, yeah, the Raiden character is, like, based on Big, the, the character in, in Big Trouble in Little China, as is Fujin. So there, there are three brothers who show up in there, and those characters are totally based on there. So I was honoring that as well. I would love to see you come back as that character in the future. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's so much to do with that storyline. Is there anything in particular you would like to see them do with this new timeline after Aftermath, the DLC oh, story? I had a Dom. Dom has got like 40,000 loops to his storylines. I can't even. Like, I can't imagine that guy's job of like, here's here's the 35 different storylines that I just interwove and figured out and did all the branching for. And then, of course, like he's going to be like, get one thing wrong and like, 40,000 nerds on the internet are going to be like, you got that one thing wrong! You do it. <laughs> I could have no, done bro, it. it. It takes a lot to be a creative in this industry. I feel like some some fans sometimes lose sight of that. It takes a lot. 
Especially now, it's like it, it's like trying to write while you got like forty golden retrievers jumping on you. Like, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Is it good? What are you doing? What are you doing? When's the next Mortal Kombat? What's the next injustice? What are you doing? Exactly. What's the next Mortal Kombat? Good to you? When's it coming out? What are you doing? <laughs> it's it's a lot. What aspirations from coming loud and Liu Kang do you see in Fujin? Or did they help you create him in some way? Uh, completely separate. They were they were very 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 different. Absolutely. Very very different. You know, you've done so many fantastic franchises, especially with this one more recently, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. As yeah. of course, Terry, you're and I, I was really excited to talk about this because I was really intrigued by this because I remember when the game came out. It was so much controversy about the game and the state it was in and the bugs and stuff. What's your take on the Cyberpunk 2077 controversy now looking back on it? Um, it's a shame because the game's amazing. Um, especially now that they released the most recent patch. and uh, I think it speaks less to the controversy as much as it speaks to the nature of how difficult it is to get out a game of that caliber. Um, and how much that these gigantic companies are now beholden to their stockholders to maintain a stock price. And so they're like, well, if you don't get it out by X day, then our stock price is going to drop a dollar and we're going to lose a hundred million dollars. Right. But we have all of these pre-sales and we've got to give the, the fans something. So I hated it because I knew, having done all of the loops um, with the various different Vs and everything like that, and even stuff that I haven't seen in videos yet, right, are still out there. There's still loops that I haven't seen people do yet. Um, it, I'm gone, okay. I really wanted that game to do really well. I mean, I love, I love cyberpunk. I mean, I, that was one of the few things where I walked into that job and um, I, I walked in and I went, I know what this is. And they went, well, and they, cause I had signed all these NDAs and they were like, well, here's what we think it is. And I was like, this is who this is. This is what it is. This is the whole game. This is the this is the plot. This is the plot. This is how it is. This is based on because I played that game religiously as a teenager. I, I have all of the source books. I have all of the original source books over there signed by Mike Pondsmith because I was a dork who went to uh, who went to Comic Con in the nineties. So I'm a huge fan. So I walked into that and I went. I know what this is. I don't care if you make me little girl number four, you're giving me a character in this game. And they went, this is, and they went, okay, so here's a character we would like you to audition for. His name is Kay. And I looked at him, I went, you want, want me to play Carrie Uridine? And they were like, what? And I was like, this is this, this is this, this is who Carrie was in the thing. And then again, this is the back history. Of the, and they were like, we didn't know that. Well, where do you? And so, like, it was one of the first time I'd really, like, I had every, I had 12 years of research into the character before I did it. So, I mean, because I had game mastered the game, I had already done that voice for Carrie 20 years ago for a bunch of dorks in a room, right? While we're rolling dice and going, do you roll the hit? Well, Carrie really wants to come along and try to do it, right? So, come on. So, I had loved that character. And when I found out Keanu was doing it, and he was going to, I was like, come on. This is going to be the biggest game ever. And, you know, Keanu was so kind and, like, like I was so excited to do the game. Um, and then when, when what happened happened, it takes just as much effort to make a bad game as it takes to make a good game, right? Yep. And, and the thing was that people assumed when it went bad, and as much as I'll watch Donkey and go, like, that was really funny. That was that was incredibly funny. You making fun of that game? Um, I, I, that was the the problem was was that that it was on a hurry up schedule for, and it wasn't about fans. It was about shareholders, right? And the thing is that when gaming started, 
it was never about shareholders until money became the main issue. And now money is the main driver. And so it's become less and less about product and it's become more and more about money. And the thing is that cyberpunk is a dynamically good game you know, that's trying to do things that are really difficult. And I know for a fact that they had 25, 30 things lined up in the queue that they really wanted to do, that they were like, we're going to roll this out. But when all the negative press came out, all the breaks went on. So it's like, we're not going to do those things, right? And it's a shame. It's a real shame. So we'll see with the success, maybe the success of the next Witcher franchise, which I bet you, CD Projekt Red is going to learn from and, and they're going to be like, this comes out when it comes out. Thank you. Right. Um, and I think the industry also learned like back off, back off, man. Like stop hurrying. We don't want another cyberpunk to happen. Right. We don't want people to lose their shirts. So I think that it'll be a good cautionary tale and in the end will be better for games. Although you might have to wait four years, but I've waited 10 years for Robert, uh, for George R. R. Martin's book. So you can wait a little bit longer for a video game. I, I don't know if you've uh, heard about this game. It was this EA game called Anthem. Uh, and it was, it, there was so much promised and they were like, you're going to fly around in exosuits and you're going to go on side missions and this and the third and, and creating those struggles. Like, bro, this is insane. The game comes out. It's an absolute disaster. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing yeah. that they promised in it. Yeah, there's nothing that they promised in it. It was full of bugs, long loading screens, players everywhere were mad. I was upset because I was actually really interested. I played the demo. I was like, oh, okay, where is this going? But even then, I saw YouTube videos where people were like, this demo, I don't know. The full game comes out and it's a complete mess. Now, it makes me think, what could have been if EA just waited, because I, I think the game was delayed a couple times, but not too much. What if well, Cyber had... Cyberpunk was delayed five times already. Five times it was five was, Yeah, Cyberpunk was what I'm talking about, Anthem, that EA game that I, I was yeah. really stuck. Yeah. And it makes me just think, you know, what if these games could have just waited a little bit longer or fans could have... Because I remember when delays were announced for Cyberpunk, fans were like, I'm mad. You release this game, release this game. I get it. Like got to respect it because these games are how much money can we make? Like, we've got to come out with a product this year. If we don't come out with a product this year, then our quarterly profits are going to look flat. And if our quarterly profits are going to look flat, then these 20 investors on Wall Street are going to divest themselves of these mini stock things, which means next year we won't have the capital to raise enough money to make the blah for blah. Right. So we got to come up with something. And it's and it's they're doing that kind of math. And the thing is that because games are getting so good, you can't go, well, we can't look like The Last of Us. So we'll just go with something less than. Right. We'll just we'll just it won't doesn't have to look photo real anymore. Forget about it. So No, they're going to go as far as they got to go. And the benchmark's going to keep on climbing. So wait times are going to get longer and longer which means games have got to figure out how to make their nut in between those wait times, which means there's going to be more and more like, hey, buy this gun for sixteen ninety five, right? Because that's how they're going to keep their nut going, right? That's how they got to pay the, that's how they got to pay the bills, right? They're going like, okay, well, because uh, everybody's beholden to Wall Street. Now, how they get off that chain is get off the Wall Street chain, but that's not happening. That's not going to happen. It makes me think of what's going on with Call of Duty now, how they switched over to this battle pass method. Where of course it's not like buying like a gun, but it's like buying skins and yeah. and just buying like, a ton of skins. Yeah. And or as much like me... they dress up your dollars. <laughs> and it it's a whole mess and it's I completely agree. It's it all comes down to money. It all comes down to profit. And I wish, I really wish that you know, Call of Duty could go back to the way it was or so many of these gaming franchises could just chill out, you know, but who knows? Um, let's share it up a little bit, talk more about Carrie. Who is Carrie Uridine for people who don't know who that is? Carrie Uridine is the lead guitarist of Samurai. Do I have my hat? I don't have my hat. Hat's in the other room. Uh, he's the... Ah, I'm falling! He's <laughs> um, the... Uh, he is the lead guitarist for Samurai. He is uh, 
Johnny Silverhand's uh, left hand man, because um, Johnny Silverhand does not have a right hand. So um, he's uh, he's really cool. He's uh, the first uh, gay character, openly gay character in video games. I believe that you can play a romance all the way through with. I may be wrong, but I think that's the truth. Um, and has become the voice in many ways, not necessarily me, but the character, um, for really out LGBTQ characters um, in games. And it's become really wonderful. It's become wonderful to be part of that movement. For that song, did, were you singing? Have you sang it off of Carrie, or is that somebody else? Because I know there's a song. Carrie, that ain't me who did the final mix on that voice, you know? Okay. I was like, you sound really good. You should, like, really go for this music thing. I should I just like, open up. Just... No. No. Dang it. Ah. No. If I, I didn't do final mix, they, they, they were like, they were like, mm, let's sweeten him up. For Carrie, I know the character is like way older than he looks, and there are different points in his life that you can play. Oh at. yeah, Carrie's millennial. Carrie's a millennial. I remember I was on some message board talking about the the doing an interview about the character, and some guy was like, "I don't, you know, like I love that it's a queer queer character, but I cannot believe that Carrie is so old, right?" And I was like, "Okay, so hang on now." If it's 2079 or 2077 when this when this when this game happens, that means and Carrie is I think it's like 70. That means Carrie's a millennial, my friend. Right? Carrie <laughs> Carrie is like born in the year 2000, dude. Right? Like that means uh, <laughs> right <laughs> right. So that means right now, Carrie. I'm getting <laughs> Right? So uh, maybe stop picking on Carrie because someday you're going to be an old gay guy going like, ew, I'm yucky. Like, how about give him some respect, dude, because he's you. Right? What a, what a cool Put character. Put respect that. in your mouth. What are you talking about, Carrie? I can tell you really have a lot of passion for this character and a lot of love for this I character. Love and I love I'm, 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 I hope if they do do a sequel or do so, do you think this game can get a sequel? Do you think they could do other stuff with the character or? I hope so. I don't know. I don't know what the backlash was too much. I don't know. I, I mean, it would take a huge fan response. I mean, the thing was when they went back with one patch 1.5, it made a profit and the expansions are coming. So fingers crossed. We'll see. That's all we ever hope to do. Well, now, Matt, I want to transition into my fun part of my interviews called Weird and Wacky. So we have one minute to answer a series of weird and random questions known oh, as God. being a record of 15 questions, although the current championship title holder is Simon Norfleet with a record of 14 questions answered. Do you think you could beat him? No. All right. All right. Good. I'm I'm going to start the timer in three, two, one. Uh, longest time period without taking a shower? Longest time without taking a shower? A week and a half. Favorite dessert? Uh, profiteroles. First big acting gig you got? Friends. Favorite movie growing up? Star Wars. Favorite band? Van Halen. Least favorite genre of music? Uh, polka. Favorite restaurant? Uh, too many. <laughs> Would you rather be bitten by a dog or stung by a bee? Bee. Would you, favorite sport? Uh, track and field. Favorite color? Red, crimson. Favorite video game you've been on? Cyberpunk 2077. Favorite brand of shoes? Uh, New Balance. I don't know. I'm a dad. Would you rather walk on your hands or walk on your head? Hands. Favorite movie poster? Uh, Star Wars 1977. You won. Y'all, we have a new winner! Let's go! You did it! Let's go! 
y'all, y'all looking at your new weird and wacky championship title holder, Matt Yang King. How do you feel, Matt? How are we feeling? Huh? That was, that was, that was good. My last question for you for the day, and thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much for speaking with me again. I'm, I've just been enthralled by your stories and just how you've made it through this industry is so inspiring to me. Like I said, as someone, as a young artist, uh, trying to get into this. <laughs> Especially as a young artist in this industry, trying to make his way through everything. And I know sometimes the acting industry isn't fun. You have to deal with business people and this time and third, but just truly, Thank you for bringing inspiration to so many, including myself. And I'm so honored to have you on this platform with me today. Of course. So much. Very sweet. Absolutely. My final question for you is, if you were given a microphone and the entire world can hear you, what would mm. your message to the world be during these current times that we live in? Obviously, we're still living through a global pandemic. Laws are being changed around the world. We have the horrible situation going on currently in Ukraine. There's so much going on around the world. What would you say to people just to give them a glimpse of hope or just reassurance? Oh, God. Um, I don't feel that I have the wisdom to, to speak to 7 billion people or 7 billion people's needs. Um, Let's speak to us then. You know, we'll come from the heart with it. Um... What is it? Uh, I think it's the Alan Turing quote, which is sometimes it's from the people you least expect who do the most unexpected things. And I think that would be what it is. I don't know. Is that, that you need to really reach deep and find your passion and go for it. I don't know. That's a bit trite, but yeah, sure. I'll, I'll stick with it. No, no, that definitely. In, in this life, there's so much going on and there's so much that we could do and so much that we could say. And, you know, there's not one right answer for this question. I mean, no, there's so many there things you could go with. This, it's you, whatever it is for you. It's whatever absolutely. it is for you. Yeah. And do what you love as much as you can. All yeah, right, guys, that was my oh, there you go. Do what you love. The rest comes. Yeah. Absolutely. That was my interview with the phenomenal Matt Yang King, everyone. Before we go, Matt, can I get a shout-out in the voice of Liu Kang? A shout-out for Jam More TV? Is this what you want? Do you want the shout-out for Jam More TV? Yes. All right. All right. As Liu Kang. Yep. All right. All right. Let's see. I'll look, gather my thoughts. I usually have but like 15 takes on my cameo, so I got to like figure out. All right. Ladies and gentlemen and all my disciples, you are watching Gent More TV. Tune in for more interviews and great questions coming up soon. Lu Kang, stop out. Kick ass, man. Matt, is there anything you want uh, to promote before we head off? Uh, I got a DreamWorks show coming up. Um, there's a bunch of video games I can't talk about. Uh, season two of Trece is going to be coming out soon. So make sure you go watch season one on Netflix because season one is the bomb. Uh, if you want to see sort of Buffy and um, Buffy and Batman and uh, Criminal Minds all like have a, have a little cross action. That's Trece. Um Let's see. Yeah, they did the Dreamer show and the thing and the other thing. I'm um, going up to shoot another episode of Riverdale in like two weeks. Uh, so check me out there and uh, send wish and lux and, and all the rest, man. Otherwise, enjoy my work and, 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 and be yourselves and take care of yourselves. Take care of each other because it's all that matters. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, man. Have an amazing rest of your day. I have two get three gifts coming your way. So I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Absolutely. Great guy. Be well, my brother.